Isn't that good news about Linda? Yeah, uh, Millie and Rochelle and I got to go and see her and lay hands on her and pray for her um, this past week. And, and man, uh, it just, it was difficult to see. It's difficult to see someone that you love in a situation where they're sick. It's difficult to see them with the, the, um, the, the breathing tubes and all those things that, that we have to suffer through when you're sick. And so um, pray for them. Pray not only for Linda, but pray for her family. We were so blessed as we went in there, though, because typical, if, you know, if you're a visitor, you don't know these folks, but um, if you stick around, you'll get to know them. John King is the most loving, jolly guy in the planet. I mean, he's just, and, and you know, typical John King, those of you that know him will understand that he said this afterwards. He says, oh, I'm so glad you guys came. I want to buy you guys lunch, you know? <laughs> I mean, he's sitting in there just completely in the trial of his life, but all he can think about is making sure that we have food and would love to go and buy us lunch. He, he says, I want to buy you lunch. I just can't get away right now. And so we're like, hey, I think we kind of understand. So anyways, the Lord is good. Um, this morning, I feel like we've already had church. I do. I feel like between Scott and Andy and Rochelle, man, I am good. And so um, I'm going to call it at 1115. Amen. <laughs> I think it's true, though. Everything they said just fits such a great pattern, you know, that regardless of what we feel or think, that God is faithful, whether we're up or whether we're down. But I mean, something Rochelle said is so key, and it, it goes to some of the things that I'm going to share today, is what is our identity, you know? And I, I want to tell you that um, when she made that statement, like, I'm, this is my name and I'm a child of God, I hope that you'll wear that same name tag that, that she declared because there, there are, are a few identities that um, the enemy wants us to wear, and we talked about it last week. He wants us to wear the identity of unwanted, right? That when we step into the room, it's like, no one wants me anyways. I don't even know why I'm here. Hi, my name is so-and-so. You don't want to be my friend. But I'm shaking. I'm going through the motions. I'm giving you the hug. You know, and we, we, we wear that identity, and it's broadcast into our life through um, difficulties we experience in childhood or difficulties that are presently going on in our lives. There's another identity that we wear that we say, um, I'm, I'm just completely unworthy. Like, look how godly all these people are. They must have been born right in the church, and they all can, they know the Bible, and they can quote it backwards and forwards, and they even dress Christian, you know. I just, I'm so unworthy, you know. And then, then there's that, that, that final one that I'm just irrelevant. I'm just not that cool. I mean, look at how cool that so-and-so is or so-and-so is. And the devil just lies to us along those lines. And it doesn't matter what age we are or what stage that we're in. But the couple identities that scripture says that we are is one, as Rochelle said, that we're a child of God and we're loved by God. But I just think if we can just believe that and drive that message into children and build from that foundation. You have a solid generation of people who really can walk with Jesus and know what relationship with God is all about and then live holy lives. So to know that you're a child of God, to know that you're loved by God. And then a third identity that I think is really important is that you're a servant of God. Man, if you get all those three, you won. (laughs) You won because, one, you, you know who you are, and it's not a pride thing. It's that you're able, you're able to, um, to walk with your head high because you know who your Father is, your Heavenly Father is. You know that regardless of your past, you're loved and you're forgiven. But, but if, you just, if you just wear that alone, you might miss something that part of your identity is also servant of God. And what I love about servants of God is they can do anything. No job is too big and no job is too little. That those who have those three things are super effective and, uh, and wonderful for the kingdom of God. So um, this morning, I want to give you just a few things. Um, I want to go back into the book of Exodus, and um, I'm going to give you a point, my point, and my whole reason for sharing this right out of the gate, and then I'm going to try to tell you why I'm saying what I'm saying. But I think we need to hear something about this multi-generational type thinking, okay? Uh, last week, I began to talk to you a little bit about um, the lies that we believe, and I just shared those lies once again. And those lies impact every age. There's one way that I've heard it said before, too, that when, when you're too young, you can't do anything for God because you're too young, right? And then when you're in the next phase in life, you're a little too busy, so you can't do anything for, for God. And then when you're too old, you can't do anything for God because why? You're just too old. And then the next phase is what? You're too dead. So that's just there it went, you know. But God does not move or, or think or, or impart things to us in that way. God is a, a multi-generational, um, I won't say he's multi-generational as character because he's timeless, but he thinks and he acts and he pours out in multi-generational ways. Uh, and I'll show you that in scripture. 
Um, all throughout the Word of God, you read about um, three generations together. And do you remember in Exodus when, when we talked about Moses and in his progression going from the baby in the basket into Pharaoh's house and then into his young years when he and his passion just killed an Egyptian and then he got called out by his own people for, for breaking up a fight. And then where does he end up? In Midian. And, and there in Midian, he, he sees um, the Lord and there's this burning bush. It's burning, but it's not catching on fire. And God introduces himself. And what does God say to him? I am the God of who? Come on, you guys are super Christians. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Three generations, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Last week, I shared with you a, a scripture um, from 1 John. Let me read that to you. It's, it's 1 John chapter 2. And this is John, um, the apostle, and he's talking to a, a young church. And he's talking to them about phases and stages in their life. And he defines them as, as children, as young, and as parent, right? And it doesn't necessarily mean that that is the exact family way, but he's talking about stages, right? He's talking about the, the, the newness of your salvation. He's talking about a mature, a maturing walk with God and then this mature walk with God. And I think that these stages come with time with the Lord as well as chronological years. But this is what he says. In verse 12 of of 1 John chapter 2, I write to you, dear children, because um, your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you've known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. And I write to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. And then we roll into Acts chapter 2, and we love Acts chapter 2, man. Acts chapter 2 is the birthday, the beginning, the launching point of this church, this, this bride of Christ. And, and when the Holy Spirit is poured out, and there's craziness that happens, right? Um, it's still controversial today that some people speak in other tongues, and people begin to glorify God in languages that are not their own. And miracles happen, and salvation comes. And what does Peter say as he's, he's being encountered by the critics who say, you guys are drunk and crazy. And he says, no, nah, it's too early in the morning. Something else is happening here. And what he says to them is, this is a fulfillment of what Joel prophesied. And I'll read that to you. Flip with me if you want to in your Bibles. Just do a little, little uh, Bible turn in. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. This is what it says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on who? On super young, cool people. I will pour out my spirit. I will pour out my spirit on all people, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. And even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and the signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. And the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is good stuff. This is the stuff that we long for. I can't tell you how many people that I know that are hungry for God, that are praying, God, would you pour out your spirit? Last night um, in, at the Coliseum in Los Angeles, thousands gathered and they began to cry out and pray and in prayer and fasting and worship and celebration, just saying, God, would you pour out your spirit as you did over 100 years ago on Azusa Street? Would you bring forth that same revival? So as they celebrate that anniversary, there are people crying out for the outpouring of God's spirit. It was pretty powerful. You know, I, I wasn't there personally, but I could see the live feed from YouTube. I love the times that we live in that connect us together in that way. But the the outpouring that that is being spoken of in this outpouring that we desire, it involves not just one group or not just another group, but it involves generations together. And that's such an important part that we we understand, not just as us as Zion. I think we need to understand it here, but we have to understand it globally. I'm so sorry if it's distracting, but I feel like it's ringing pretty bad over there, if you can. Thank you. Um, so I was thinking about this thing of, of generations, and um, here's the point that I was going to tell you in the very beginning before I, I read all that scripture. I believe that as simple as this, if this is my message I could get across today, I would say it to you in this way. Be fully you. 
What does that mean? Be fully you. I wrote down here, your personality, your core. You see, your, your soul doesn't change in that regard, or your core, your heart, who you are, who God's made you. That this is why you feel the same as you did when you were a teenager, or that you feel the same as you did. I mean, deep in that core, you might not be that. You, yeah, I was wrestling with, how do you describe these three generations? Do you just call people young and old? Can you even do that? And I'd probably say yes in this crowd. I don't think anyone's going to be deeply offended by that. Um, but, you know, you have this child generation, you have this younger generation, and then you have this not-so-young generation. And, and I thought that there'd be a giggle for that. Please just <laughs> give me something here this morning. And, um, and, and, you know, we struggle even hearing that going, shoots, am I in that uh, not-so-young generation? And, and I, you know, you work that out, you and God, okay? But, <laughs> but whatever phase you're in, you don't feel like that phase, okay? That's because you are who you are. Who you are, who God made you to be, that's who you are. But as we saw from Moses' life, and I'll show you some more today, that as stages change in your life, so does your mission. It's different. You're the same, and you need to be the same, but your mission is different. And it's a little unsettling. It's difficult. One one time we were talking about our church because we were going through so many changes many years ago. We said, we should be called Transition Christian Center. (laughs) Just everything feels like a transition, you know? You hear the, the analogies of this preach. It preaches really well, like the passing of the baton, right? You know, you're one generation passing the baton on to the other. And that's an unsettling kind of, um, of analogy, right? Because it leaves one generation going, well, I don't got a baton in my hand anymore. I don't get to run the race? What's up? But God calls his people to work together, and that's not even true. God doesn't call one generation to pass the baton and then bail out. There's this position or this um, stage in the race where, where runners are running. And you, you know this if you've watched the Olympics or if you ran track. I, I actually ran the relay when I was in junior high. And, and I don't remember this stage because I just remember um, well, not being so good at it. Just want to get that stick out of my hand because the other guys were so far ahead. And, but, but when you do it right, you're running in, in in, in perfect rhythm with the runner in front of you. And as you're running, you, they start the run, and they begin to get your cadence. And, and then as you stick, put that baton in their hand, what happens? For a period of time, you're literally running together until you... And when the Olympians do it, it's so cool. It's just like butter. I just go... And, and it's like nothing ever stopped. One to the other. And I would say that the working of generations together is more like that than it is. Here you go. You, you kids run it now. Hope you don't mess it up. And then without the baton, one generation is going, did you see what they're doing? I remember when we were running, we did not run like that. I wish they ran like that. <laughs> but it's, it's the generations together. And that period of transition is a long time in church, in church world, okay? In, in kingdom world. It isn't just a few seconds like you see in a race, but it is a long period of time. And I believe that we need to begin to think generationally. Think together. Think that we're holding a baton together, but we have different roles, and there are different missions. So in thinking about, like, we, we haven't changed. That's why we feel the same. I was thinking about a few stories. I'll embarrass my, my wife for, for me. I'll apologize later, but <laughs> I remember years ago, we live right near Chapman University. We love this town. We love this city. Um, some of our neighbors complain, like, oh, the college students are moving in. We're like, bring them in. You know, we just love the foot traffic. We love you know, kids on bikes, college students just walking around. I mean, it's just a cool town. And in that cool town, um, the, the Chapman, a lot of times Chapman students have really cool beach cruisers, you know. And, and one girl on our street, has, she's the cutest girl, you know. She's got her beach cruiser with her basket. She puts her little books in there and just, you know, rides to school, just off to college, right? And, and, and one day, Rochelle was saying, she, she's, Rochelle has a cool beach cruiser, too. I, I bought it for her, by the way. It's really cool. And... <laughs> It has a basket and everything else. And, and so she had her, she was off doing something and just rode her bike down in the circle. I don't know if she's heading to the library or, or what, you know, um, like we all hang out at the library. I don't know why I even said that. And, and, and she, she had stuff in her basket and she had um, her, her headphones in because that's like standard, you know, uniform. And, and they had to be like the iPhone white ones, you know, so those are in. That was good. And she looked cute, and she's just riding down the street. And she said this, she had this thought, like, you know, she's riding with the others. She's like, I 
I'm just like that. Like I, I mean, I look just like a Chapman student. I, I feel cute and good. And then, and, and then she turned around and she noticed that she was the only Chapman student with an infant seat on the back of her beach cruiser. So reality said it. Feel the same way. Feel the same way. But life had a different stage for my wife. So because I've embarrassed her, I was actually thinking of that story, but I thought of one for my, myself. So I have these nephews. I love my nephews, and they're close in age. And they were like, I think at this time, they were like 15 and 16. And some of the things we used to do when they were real little, I'd take them on skateboard missions. I said, go on a mission. When they'd come over to my house, we'd get our skateboards, and we'd skateboard where you shouldn't skate. And they thought they were getting away with something because they were breaking the rules with their uncle. And, and so we, I go, let's go on a mission. They're like, yeah. I go, yeah, let's do it. So we got our skateboards, and we're skating around Chapman and skating over the train station. And, and the, there's this one moment where um, years ago it would have been no problem for me to, to you know, what you'd call ollie off of one gap into another. And I was feeling it. I was with the boys, man. We were just like, Yeah. And I was skating and skating. And, and I get to this curb, and, I, and I'm just like, yeah. They pop, pop, you know, hit their ollie and pop, pop. They go, pop, pop. And then it comes to my turn, and I'm like, pop, poof. <laughs> and, I, and I hit this rock, and I just like, you know, the, 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 they used to call it the Pete Rose back in there. I just, <laughs> And my oldest nephew turns around, and he's like, seriously? <laughs> he's like. He's like, I, I, I hit that, and I was looking over my shoulder going, what's he going to do? And he's like, you, really? It, 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 I felt like I was going to nail that. I'm not there anymore. <laughs> Something's changed, you know? <laughs> the point is this, though. I don't stop being who I am. I don't stop my personality. I change my game a little bit. I change my influence. The things that I talk about with those same nephews are different than when they were eight and nine years old. I have a different role in their life. And it, it just as that is true um, for you in, in your spheres of influence. And so we have got to be exactly who we are. That's who God wants us to be, the phase that we're in, um, the, the situation that we find ourselves in life. Um, and we need to embrace that and to be able to not believe this huge lie of our culture and society that somehow we're just chasing this fountain of youth, that somehow if we look younger, dress younger, um, do younger stuff, that we'll magically stay at a certain age or magically become younger. There's something so beautiful about those who know who they are, a true beauty that, is, that, that grows and expresses themselves appropriate to the age that God has given them. It's something so uh, reassuring, especially for Christian people. It's just like, ah, oh, you know, I want to be around you. And the opposite is true. When we try to be somebody that we're not, we, we exude insecurity and not even know. Isn't it tricky how that all works? We think that we're doing something to feel more secure, but we actually are exuding an insecurity. And it's putting off the very people that we want to like us or draw us near. And so that's what we're called to do. And so there's a, a few um, things that I want to share in the story of, of Moses as I really delved into it. And as I went around that same passage that I shared with you last week, I noticed something um, that I, I didn't notice last week. I was focusing on Moses and his stages of development. And the reason that it's important to be who you are and the reason that it's important to accept where you find yourself in life and I mean that as a Christian person, okay? If you find yourself in the middle of sin and you're struggling or whatever else, don't accept that. That's not your destiny, okay? You can find your way out of that through the help of the Lord Jesus Christ, through the body of Christ. That's what the church is all about. I was reading in my journal the other day that, that um, one of the missionaries that we were spending time with in Mexico a few weeks ago or months, I don't know how long it was, he says, um, he says God is merciful, but he wants me to be holy. And I said, that, that, that quote just stuck with me. God is merciful, but he wants me to be holy. And so when I say accept where you're at, don't accept where you're at in the midst of your sin. You can find your way out. God is merciful and he wants you to be holy. But I, I'm saying that as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ. And I saw a few characters in this story that I hadn't really paid much attention to because they're like one sentence people in the story. And don't neglect one sentence people in the story. There are volumes to be said of what they accomplished. And the two people in Moses' life in this early stage were his sister and his mother. We don't know a whole lot about Moses' sister and his mother. We know their names. They're kind of funky names. Her, her name was um, Jochebed. And I shouldn't have said that because somebody probably has an aunt Jochebed, or if that is your name today, <laughs> deep apologies. 
Um, but that's her name, his mother. We, we know that from a genealogy. And, and outside of that, we know that, that she was married to a much older man. We know that she, in the, in, in the midst of a time when um, many of the Hebrew people were neglecting God, she stayed faithful. We know about his sister. We know her name is Miriam. We know a bit more about her because she walked with Moses through the wilderness. She had, some, she had some victories and some defeats, no doubt. But in this account, there's just a couple of sentences, and I want to focus on them. So let me read it to you. Um, if you want to turn to Exodus chapter 2. And we know where we left off in this, well, let me lead you up until this point. We know that Pharaoh had issued an edict that all the male children were to be killed. The, the, the midwives, if, they, if, if the Hebrew women were giving birth, the child came forth as a male, the midwife was instructed to kill the child. There were midwives who, re, who remained righteous who refused to do it. Moses is that story he, he, that his mom, she had him. She realized there was something special about her child. She preserved his life. She kept him until she couldn't keep him any longer. And when she couldn't keep him any longer, she made a basket and she made sure that that basket was completely secure. You know, if there was like how things are made, you know, if there was a documentary then, I bet you that was the most secure watertight basket known to man because that's how moms rock. I mean, if a mom is gonna make sure that their child is okay, and so she, she wove that basket and she made it just right. And she, uh, you, you can't even imagine that moment for her where at the, the banks of the Nile, she was like, I trust you, God. She lets her, her son go. We know the story unfolds that, that um, Pharaoh's daughter is there and she's bathing with some of her people and she sees this child. There's something special about this child. She takes a child as her own. And so that's kind of where we pick up on the story. Verse 4. It says that Pharaoh's sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. And when Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the riverbank, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent a slave girl to get it. And she opened it and saw the baby and he was crying and she felt sorry for him. And this is one of the, this is one of those Hebrew babies, she said. And then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. And so the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and, she be- and he became her son, and she named him Moses. I drew him out of the water. Talking about phases and stages in life. Okay, first of all, Moses' stage in life at that point in time was what? Child, infant. I mean, when we read of of what John was saying, that's like a time of grace, you know? Children should be in a protected environment where they're able to just grow and thrive. Don't you agree? Children should have a roof over their head. Children should have good food. Children should have space to explore the world, find out how wonderful their world is around them. They should be able to eat bugs and dirt, okay? Just let them do it. They will be just fine. They, they should be able to, to make sandcastles and, and build blocks and play Legos and write poems and draw pictures. I mean, this is what, isn't it true that this is what should happen for children, And sadly, that is not the case for many children, and that was not the case for Moses. And as I was thinking about this and I was reading through the story, I was thinking about how the church sometimes plays the redemptive role for for children and giving them a place to be a child. And what a great and high calling that we have. I was thinking back probably 10 years ago when I, you know, or even further, when I first started here, there were some kids that were around here, and, and they were from a rough background, and there were two siblings in particular and these two siblings, um, they, were, they were difficult. And it was pretty clear, it was pretty evident that they were living this kind of childhood that wasn't protected, it wasn't safe, it, it wasn't grace-filled and everything that I experienced. It wasn't fun. And, um, and through a course of events, the um, police got involved in a situation. I remember talking to an investigator. And the investigator was asking me some questions, and I was a- answering him as honestly as possible. And, um, and the outcome was whether these children were going to be removed from the home or whether they were going to be able to stay in the home. Because it was at a point where their parents just might, it was just right on that borderline, are they unfit? And one of the things the investigator said, um, we were going through the whole thing, 
And, and the investigator said to me, she goes, you know, there's one place in all my interviews um, with these kids, there's one place that they continually talk about. It's your church. And what they talk about in the church is that there's a place that they can draw pictures and they can sing. They sang some of the songs for me and they showed me some of their pictures. And she said, it was the, it, you know, and I, God, I mean, pray for social workers, pray for those that have to make these critical decisions, Right. But she said that was part of the decision-making process was if I take these kids from their home, they will not have any experience of childhood like they're having for, with you guys right now. You see, I don't, I don't say that to toot our horn, but what I'm trying to tell you is that sometimes we get to play that, that redemptive role. And if we miss who we are in our phase, and if we miss that, that opportunity to protect children, we've missed it. And so when I, through that context, began to look at Miriam, okay, Miriam, her, her name um, means in, in some translations, there's, you know, Hebrew has got these uh, combinations of words that make words, okay? And so Miriam, it means bitter, bitter waters, but it also means like this, uh, I wrote it down here, let's see if I can find it. Um, it, it I think it was the waters of strength, Okay. So just as, as, as water could be bitter, like a strong taste, there was this other um, kind of idea that her name could have possibly meant waters of strength, like a strong taste, a strength to her. And I don't know if that's true or not, but something about her was wise enough and she had enough finesse to be able to go, okay, my brother is being put into the Nile. And so what does she do? She posts up to see what's going to happen. And when she does and she realizes that her her, her baby brother is being taken by Pharaoh's daughter. She doesn't like freak out. She doesn't go, hey, don't touch my brother. Get away from him. <laughs> my brother. I mean, she's secure enough to go, okay, this is a moment. My, my brother's childhood is at stake here. I need to be who I am. And, and maybe me being who I am as his sister can help protect something of him. It, it's going to be bad for him. I know that, but maybe I can help. And as, as, as one who sits back and she watches and she goes, okay, here's my opportunity. She doesn't go up to Pharaoh's daughter and go, hey, check it out. I'm his sister. I know what he needs. His mom's right over there. And um, let's make a deal because he's going to be crying because he's not going to get his food. So maybe she can help. She doesn't do that. She's, she's wise enough and, and to sit back and to suggest something. You know, the, the wisdom of finesse to have the other person think that it was their idea. That's kind of what she does. And then how cool that she's able to not only um, get Pharaoh's daughter to go, oh yeah, you know what, that is a good idea. And then to get, um, to have a suggestion for her, go, I know just the lady, do you want me to go get her? Yeah, yeah, go for it. And then she goes and gets her brother's mom, their mom. How cool is that? But see, if she was stuck in her own world, if she was stuck in her own sorrow, if she was stuck in her own, like, man, when I was a baby, my mom didn't weave me a basket. I wish I would have a basket. Like, did you see how long she spent on that basket? <laughs> if she was stuck in something like that, not realizing this is my moment. So, so Miriam, strong waters. Miriam, finesse. Miriam, one who, who had the ability to see an opportunity and, and didn't blow it, but she walked in wisdom and she impacted a child's life. And so then the, the next person that, um, that I looked at was, was um, Moses' mother, Jochebed. And here's what it says. Yes, go. And this is Exodus 2, 8. Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. And so the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And she named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. Jochebed's name means God's glory. And it's to be understood as God is, is my glory. In other words, it's I don't take glory in other things. I don't take glory in other identities, but I take glory. My glory is that, that I'm God's. That was how her name was to be understood. And that's pretty amazing when you think of what this woman did. So we don't know how long that period of, of nursing was. It's possible she had that child Moses for three to five years. That's a significant period of time. You know, we even know from um, psychology and from developmental studies today, a lot of attachment clearly happens in those times. That literally what happens in those years affects you. It begins the hardwiring process in your life for years to come. Isn't that interesting? 
that instead of this mom going, oh my gosh, God, I'm so mad at you. I don't even know what to do. This is such a terrible injustice. I'm, I'm going to flee Egypt some way. I can't even handle this pain anymore. But, but she takes it. She sees what's happening. She takes, this is where I find myself, she says. This is where I find myself. This is my reality. I feel like that joyful mom when I just gave birth to this child, but, but, but I find myself in this place of sorrow. And I'm going to take care of this baby. And she does. And you know what? I've got to imagine that, that as she fed that child, she nursed him and loved on that child, she was doing the, the, just the Hebrew mama download. Okay, this is everything you need to know about your ancestors. This is all truth. And just began speaking in and depositing into her son's life. Then she does all of that. And then she realizes something else that there's this period of transition that had to be so incredibly difficult. Every mom in this room is just going, I can't even imagine. Can you imagine giving away your child two times? First into that Nile River for God to give that child back and to be able to allow you to nurture them. And then the second time to go, okay, well, yeah, here is your son, Pharaoh's daughter. And her doing that was an act of trust. And do you realize this? Miriam was a protector Miriam was a, a door opener. Jochebed released destiny for her son. She literally released her son into the call of God upon his life. Didn't feel like it, I guarantee it. And so what am I saying to all of us? Yeah, maybe guys are going, okay, I'm neither a mom nor a sister. <laughs> the principle is true for us, regardless of if we're male or female. The principle is this, that there are people in our world. There are people in our sphere of influence. There are those that God has called us if we will be who we truly are. Not trying too hard to be somebody that we're not, but God may just want us to be protecting somebody. God just may be wanting us to stand up for the rights of those who can't stand up for themselves. This may be actually found in scripture. God may be wanting us to speak up for the voiceless. God may be wanting us to posture ourselves in such a way where we could see what's going on. Okay, I'm seeing what's going on. And instead of just spouting off and emotionally speaking or whatever else, walking in wisdom, I see something that's happening. This is oppressive towards children. I, I've got to stop it. What do we do here? Getting the wisdom of God and opening up opportunities for other people to then take a child and, and, and to disciple a child and then to release a child into their destiny. Wouldn't God want to do that today? Wouldn't God want to do that for us? Say yes, for crying out loud. He would. He would. He would. He'd want to do it even, in the, even right in, within our own homes, you know, but certainly within our own church. And we've already seen it with that one story that I shared, just an example of the way that the church became a, a redemptive family. And so here, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up for you. I, I think we need to begin to think more, um, more generationally. I think we need to think multi-generational. I think that... Um, Miriam got involved. Uh, Jacobed created opportunities. I'm going to tell you, talk to you next week about this guy, Raul. Um, I, I just gave him a Hispanic name. I don't really know if that's how you pronounce it. But, but he was Moses' father-in-law. And as we trace through these different stages and phases that we find ourselves in, um, here's another man who's, who's now... Um, older than Moses, and he's also opening a door for him. And you'll see how that you might fit that role for somebody. But I want to tell you, as you're hearing all this stuff, and you're just going, okay, I, I think I understand what you're trying to say, be myself and look for opportunities to help other people. Um, realize that for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there was always this passing or walking or transitioning together. There was always something that one generation was taking care of in another generation. They were making the way. They were making sure that they understood the ways of God. They were training and teaching them. And if you're in the older generation and you don't have someone near you that you're pouring into, you, you, you got to look at that. You got to look at that. And you might say, oh, well, nobody wants to listen to me. Why? They don't want to listen to me because I'm unwanted, unworthy, and irrelevant. You got to get past that. There are people there. Do you know what um, people in a younger generation long for? Moms and dads. Like never before, moms and dads. Do, do you know what you might, might stop you from being that to somebody? I didn't go to seminary. I, 
barely understand the Bible myself. I don't pray enough. I don't worship enough. I'm not good enough. That's just baloney. That's just, you are a child of God. Do, do you think that Miriam had attended seminary? Do you think that Miriam could quote the whole of the Old Testament or at least the Pentateuch? I doubt it. I think she was Moses' sister. I think that she was used by God because she was willing to be there and to do it. And I was um, thinking about this and how complicated that we can make things and how we think, well, uh, okay, is, our, is, there a, is there a sign up in the back? Do, are we doing a thing here? Like, <laughs> is there training for this? Um, no, this is life. This is what we do. This is community. We impart to one another. And, and should there be training along the way? Absolutely. And, and should we be imparting godly good things? And should we? Yes, yes, yes. If you put yourself in that position where you will be um, from the generation that's helping a younger generation, and, and by the way, if you're even like a teenager, you know, I, I can remember in my childhood, do you know who I thought was incredibly cool? Like 40-year-olds, I thought they were so cool. No. <laughs> I remember when I was a teenager, when I was a kid, I would be like, whoa, that guy's like 18. He's like a beard. That is so cool, you know? <clears throat> I tell, I've told this story before, but I remember on a, on a camping trip one time, I was just really little, and we used to go camp at the same place, and there happened to be a church group, like a youth group, and, uh, and they were camping there too, and, and they just like welcomed us in. And uh, we were Christians, so it was comfortable for us, but they had their campfire, and they would like sing songs, and they would talk to us. I remember this guy... He was this big Hawaiian guy. I just remember, man, he just was huge. And he's just big muscles, man's man. And, and I, I was like, whatever you say is absolute truth. I will follow you because you are so cool. And fortunately, this man loved God. And this man, I don't remember the words that he said to me, but I remember I associated the fact that here is somebody that I really look up to. And I saw him at night playing a guitar and worshiping God. And that alone made me want to, it made me hungry and thirsty for more of Jesus. There's something to that teenager. There's something, so wherever we find ourselves, we should be looking in this direction. We should be just looking in that direction. And, and I think that this is a message for everyone that is in this direction, meaning if someone's pouring into your life, you've got to learn how to live in a culture of honor and respect. A culture of honor and respect, that is biblical. You remember that thing in the Bible that says, honor your parents because it's right? And then it has this promise, it's going to go really well with you. It's absolutely true. And I don't think that it's a stretch to make that a principle to say, honor the parent generation. Honor the parent generation and it'll go well with you. Because it'd be a little silly to go, man, I disrespect all other adults except my mom and dad. My mom and dad, I honor them. I don't need to honor you. <laughs> silly, right? So you understand, to honor a parent generation, and that's how it works. Abraham giving resource to Isaac, you know, paving the way for him. Isaac releasing Jacob into his destiny. And Jacob honoring Abraham, you know. It's just, this is how church works. This is how God works. This is how God longs to pour out. And so I encourage you um, to think multi, multi-generationally and do your part. And, and your part might look a lot like um, a story that I just heard last week. So last week, we have a memorial service in here for Roy Hendricks. And, you know, this place was filled with people. A lot, a lot of people I didn't know. A lot of young people. And so as different ones got up to share, you know, and, and I've done a fair amount. I've been a pastor for 16 years, so I've done a fair amount of memorial services now. And most often, they're either a family says, I, we have five people who want to share, just open it up for anyone. And usually there's just a little bit of, of lead time, right? When you say, does anyone want to say anything about the person who passed? Usually there's a little bit of time, and you, you, know, you pause, and then one person just stands up and will start the process, and then many will... There was like a line of people. Like, does anyone want to say, poof, someone's up here. I won't come up here and say something in front of everybody. You know? One after the other after the other. And it was the same story. That's how you know it's true. Young people coming up and saying, um, I lived in their neighborhood. He was called Papa to them. Okay? Nobody said, hey, Roy was like this really great guy. Every single person who spoke about Roy that was from a younger generation said, Papa, right? 
Papa was exactly what I needed in my neighborhood. One person said, I grew up in a foster home. I didn't know what it was like to have a dad. Papa showed me what it was like to work hard every day. Then uh, another young woman would come up and say, Nana and Papa together showed us what it was like to, to be married. They showed us what it was like to, to honor each other and to be nice to each other. Nana used to scold us when we fought and said that we're Christians and Christians are brothers and sisters and so brothers and sisters shouldn't fight. Nana used to give us Bible studies. And then afterwards, and I mean, I'm telling you, one after the other. And what was striking to me was there was a, a generation of those that are now in their late 20s, early 30s that were saying that. And then there was another generation that stood up and said, oh, I was, so they would be like grandkids to Roy and Nancy. And then this other, others in their late 40s and 50s stood up and said, I grew up in that neighborhood. And, um, and they took me in as their own. Two generations of people that were impacted because these people were teaching them theology every day a living theology. They were not getting out and laying it down. They were living out their life. Uh, uh, one of the young women afterwards, she was in the other room and she, she had on her cell phone a photo. She, she shows me this picture and there's like 12 kids sitting in a circle in the front lawn and she points herself out and then she points out Kayla and then she points out Montez, a couple of other girls that used to be in our youth group. Crazy. How cool that it was to see all those stories embodied in that picture. And this, is, this is what we did every day after school. Why? Because their, their doors were open and they, were, they, they cared enough. They cared enough to be who they were for another generation. Um, that was their legacy. That is Roy's legacy, that he served well, that he, he looked this way, Right? Uh, they, they said, was, was he perfect? No. And some of them said, I was afraid of him sometimes, you know. <laughs> All good things. Like you, you, you could see the full picture of who this person was. But he was looking in this direction intentionally. Like Miriam, he was positioned in a place where he could see what was going on. And seeing what's going on, he could say, okay, these kids need us. We might not be able to pay for all their clothes. We might not be able to send them to the best college. We might not be able to teach them all these skills. But one thing that we've got, we can teach and show them love. And they want parents and they need them. You can do it. You can, you can be that for somebody. And you can think generationally. So begin to get your wheels spinning in that way because I think that when we read about what, what um, is established in Acts chapter 2, that outpouring is not just for one generation. It's on all people, on sons and daughters, on young, on, on not so young, on children. Amen? Amen? Why don't we stand to our feet? I'm going to ask Ben and the worship team to come... Um, I want us to sing that song that welcomes the Holy Spirit, because outside of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, um, I, we would just have maybe an inspirational message and an inspirational story. But when the Holy Spirit works in us, we have transformation, right? So don't just be inspired today, but open up your heart to be, trans, to be transformed. And, and maybe as you're singing this song, um, you might just open up your heart to say, God, who's right here? Okay, do you follow what I mean by that? I find myself at this place in life, and who's right here? And I hope that there's someone right there for you. I hope that there's someone who's speaking into your life. But instead of longing for someone to mentor you, begin to mentor somebody else. Instead of longing for, for a father or for a mother, be that for somebody else, regardless of what age you find yourself in. And then be a people of honor, be a people of respect to the generations. Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long to be overcome by your presence. See the Holy Spirit. Your glory, God, is mine.
God, I thank you. I thank you this morning. I thank you for every life here. God, I thank you for the Miriams, Moses' sister. I thank you for the the parent generation. Those are like Moses' mom. Next week, we'll hear about Moses' father-in-law. We see throughout woven in, in your story opportunities for us to be involved in your will and your plan, not just for ourselves, but we learn to do what you did, Jesus. We consider the needs of others as greater than our own. God, I pray, Lord, that you would begin to stir something in each one of our hearts as we took, take our gaze maybe off of the overwhelming things happening in our own lives or maybe the, the lack of input that we've had from somebody else. As we take our eyes off of that, help us to see what's right around us. Maybe there are neighborhood kids. Maybe there are coworkers. Maybe there are those that um, are in our own family that instead of trying to mold and shape them into something, we can just show them your love. And as relationship is established, that they, what they see lived out in us is a relationship with Jesus Christ, and they begin to grow, and the Spirit is poured out upon them. God, we ask that you would do a great work. Lord, we pray that you would minister to each person here. And God, that in us here as a church body, that we would think more multi-generationally. And I praise you for it. God, bless each one this week. God, I pray you'd strengthen them and bless them again. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you.